This is a good deal. A comprehensive long-term deal with Iran that will prevent it from obtaining a nuclear weapon. The administration greenlights roughly $10 billion for Iran. What is wrong with this president? President Biden keeps giving them money to buy weapons to try to kill us. That a major Iranian attack aimed at military targets in Israel could happen as soon as today. What is Iran's axis of evil? Today, we'll talk about terrorist organizations like Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis and their ties to Iran. It's important for every American to understand who these terrorists are, not as distant threats, but as dangerous players in a chess game where America's very existence is at stake. We'll uncover the origins, evolution, and ambitions of these terrorist organizations. We'll explore how Iran's backing has transformed them into significant geopolitical actors, directly impacting American and Western interests. So sit back, grab a coffee, and listen as we reveal the real dangers Iran poses to the free world. It's time to look beyond the headlines, to understand the threat, and to prepare for the challenges ahead. On the morning of October 7th, in an unprecedented and unprovoked assault, Hamas and allied Palestinian terrorists launched a devastating series of attacks on Israeli territory, marking the most deadly assault on Israeli territory and civilians since the Arab-Israeli War of 1948. This day, known as Black Saturday in Israel, saw over 3,000 rockets fired and ground incursions that led to the massacre of civilians and soldiers alike, leaving a tragic toll of 1,139 deaths and numerous others including the elderly, women and children, taken hostage. The assaults, which included the barbaric taking of hostages and rape, were not just attacks on Israel, but an Iranian-backed attack on the values of freedom and democracy that America holds dear. The strategic financial backing and encouragement from Iran in these attacks underscore the broader threat Iran's proxy warfare poses, not only to Israel, but also to Western and American interests. It is our interest, first of all, that our closest ally in the region, Israel, is secure, and that it restores its sense of security and deterrence, which it lost on October 7th. And if it loses this war in Gaza, then its enemies, which are also our enemies, such as Iran, is a winner. But I do believe this is a civilizational war, and uh, uh, if the jihadi extremists, and these are people who have no tolerance for gays, uh, are misogynists, treat their women terribly, who don't mind raping, killing babies, killing babies in front of their parents, parents in front of their kids. If those kind of people win, it's terrible for the United States. It's not the kind of world we want to live in. The October 7th attacks, coming amidst political turmoil within Israel and regional negotiations, were a stark demonstration of Hamas's bolstered military capabilities, thanks in large part to Iran's significant financial support. This day of terror resulted in the deadliest day for Israel and the Jewish community since the Holocaust. Now let's talk about the perpetrators, starting with Hamas. In the heart of Gaza in 1987, a new powerful force emerged on the Palestinian landscape, Hamas. Originating from the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas quickly established itself as a ruthless terrorist organization. So Israel was controlling Gaza from 1967 the 2005 when they unilaterally disengaged. They were legislative elections in Gaza. Uh, Hamas won those elections, beat Fatah, um, and then it violently threw out Fatah and took over Gaza in 2007. Ever since then, it has been attacking Israel as part of really its charter, and it seeks to eliminate it. Their approach was unhinged and merciless targeting Israeli civilian and military sites alike. Their terror is by no means in service of peace. Hamas's founding charter commits unapologetically to the physical and military destruction of Israel. By 1989, Israel's patience had reached its limit, leading to the arrest of key figures, including Hamas's founder, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, 
The 1990s saw the rise of Hamas's military wing, the Iz Adin al Qassam brigades. This era was marked by their notorious suicide bombings and relentless attacks on Israeli targets, catapulting Hamas onto the global stage of terror. But it was after 1992, following Israel's mass deportation of Hamas activists to Lebanon after Palestinians murdered several of Israel's security force personnel, that Hamas's narrative took a darker turn. In Lebanon, they forged a deadly alliance with Hezbollah and through them established ties with Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. This alliance was a game changer. Under the guidance of and with financing from Iran, Hamas transformed. They evolved from a militia to a sophisticated terror group, now equipped with advanced tactics in cyber warfare and even a naval commando unit, all funded by Iran. Well, the Iranians supply it with most of their weapons, so the overwhelming amount of the weapons. It is trained by the Iranians as Bola, which is maybe Iran's chief proxy in the region. Despite a brief period of disagreement during the Syrian civil war, the bond between Iran and Hamas rekindled, especially with the appointment of Yahya al-Sinwar, an Iran-friendly leader, in 2017. Hamas was a very well-funded and well-trained terror army focused on the destruction of Israel in the West. Now, after Hamas's October 7th attack, Israel is left fighting for its existence. In recent headlines, Hezbollah's missile attacks on northern Israel have grabbed global attention. But to truly understand this group, we need to delve into their origins and the role they play in Iran's strategic ambitions. Formed in the 1980s during the Lebanese Civil War, Hezbollah, or the Party of God, began as an anti-Israel resistance group. Over time, it has morphed into a major political and military force within Lebanon, backed heavily by Iran. Hezbollah's deep-rooted ties with Iran are no secret. As a crucial part of Iran's axis of evil, they received significant military training, arms, and financial support from Tehran, enabling them to amass a dangerous arsenal. The alliance between Iran and Hezbollah is anchored in shared Shia Islam beliefs and a mutual animosity towards America and the West. This relationship has only deepened over time, with Iran viewing Hezbollah as a key ally in its Middle Eastern strategy. As my colleague, General Yaakov Amidur said, the former security advisor in Israel said, Hezbollah was created to protect Iran. Hamas wasn't, but it has been a very useful tool for the Iranians. Lebanon's strategic location in the Eastern Mediterranean makes it a valuable asset for Iran. Hezbollah's influence within Lebanon allows Iran to project power, challenge Israel, and extend its regional influence. Following the October 7th Sabbath massacre perpetrated by Hamas, Hezbollah intensified its activities along the Israel-Lebanon border, including rocket fire towards Israeli cities. This escalation is a clear demonstration of Hezbollah's role in supporting Iran's broader agenda. American ships targeted, U.S. troops threatened, the culprits? The Houthis, a growing menace originating from Yemen. Known as Ansar Allah, they represent a significant pawn in Iran's global threat against the West. Emerging in the 1990s, the Houthis transformed from a local rebel group into Iran's strategic proxy. Today, they are a part of Iran's axis of evil, equipped with advanced Iranian missiles and drones. Iran's backing turned the Houthis from rebels into a force countering Saudi influence. Yemen's strategic location, near crucial oil routes, underlines why Iran has vested interest in the Houthi success. After the October 7 Sabbath massacre perpetrated by Hamas, the Houthis escalated their attacks. Targeting international shipping, they pose a global security threat, with intentions extending far beyond Yemen's borders. Led by figures like Muhammad Ali al-Houthi, the Houthis' rhetoric is steeped in anti-Western, anti-Semitic venom. This isn't just regional antagonism, it's a direct threat to U.S. and Western interests. Understanding the Houthi movement sheds light on the complex dynamics in the Middle East and the need for Western unity against Iran's anti-America agenda. Iran and their proxies are not just a regional issue, they are a global security concern. So we've uncovered the rise of Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis, each a key proxy in Iran's master plan to destabilize the Middle East and bring death to America. From Hamas's evolution in Gaza to Hezbollah's deep-rooted influence in Lebanon and the Houthis' strategic positioning in Yemen, we've seen the playbook of Iran's axis of evil. 
Iran's plan could not be clearer. To use these three terrorist organizations in their efforts in Syria and Iraq to surround and destroy Israel with a well-funded and armed Shia army. These terrorist organizations are not isolated threats. They're all connected, serving Iran's broader agenda to defeat America and its allies. Understanding their individual and collective impact is crucial for our national security. They attack our troops regularly in the region, and they are our closest allies in the region's main enemy, like Israel's main enemy, the Saudis and the Emiratis and so on, and the Egyptians. So it is our interest to weaken them. It is our, and also for humanitarian reasons, obviously they're a tremendous oppressor of their people, men and women, but as we've seen in the last couple of years, particularly uh, maybe grotesque how they treat their women. But this is just the beginning. Next, we will delve deeper into the specific attacks orchestrated by Iran through these proxies and how these attacks have impacted Western interests. The Iranian Revolution of 1978 to 79 marked a pivotal shift from a pro-Western monarchy to a radical Islamic Republic, altering Iran's trajectory and impacting global politics. Iran's monarchy under Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, established with the support of America, pursued modernization and westernization. Though not a perfect leader, the Shah's regime achieved significant economic growth and modernization. However, a sect of radical Islamic Iranians who hated America, the West, and the principles of liberty and democracy they stood for were brewing a rebellion against the Shah's regime. This rebellion marked the rise of Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, a central figure in the opposition. Ayatollah Khomeini was a Shia cleric who became politically prominent in 1963. Khomeini criticized the Shah's Western reforms, which included measures like land reforms that affected the wealth of some clerics and granted women the right to vote. Khomeini's critique was rooted in a Marxist vision of Islam as a liberator from colonial and capitalist influences. He advocated velayat faqi a system of governance led by Islamic jurists to ensure adherence to Sharia law. This is the Islamic set of rules that, for example, requires women to wear a hijab. Otherwise, they risk facing five to 10 years in prison and a hefty fine. Growing discontent among various anti-Western social groups fueled opposition to the Shah. This opposition was driven mainly by the Marxist and radical Islamist ideology of Khomeini. Despite advancing women's rights and educational reforms, Radical Islamists were not happy with the Shah's cozy relationship with the West. There were several key events that accelerated the revolution. The Shah's creation of a single-party system in 1975, growing economic challenges, and the brutal response to Khomeini sympathizers, notably the Black Friday massacre in September 1978, intensified public anger. The revolution gained momentum with widespread protests and strikes, culminating in the Shah's departure and Khomeini's return from exile, leading to the establishment of the Islamic Republic of Iran. The stark contrast between pre-revolutionary and post-revolutionary Iran was evident. The Shah's era was marked by progressive modernizing efforts that furthered women's rights and fostered a growing economy. The post-revolutionary Islamic Republic led to a significant rollback of Western influence and secular policies, putting a target on women's rights and freedom of expression. The Iranian Revolution was not just a political upheaval, but a profound shift in the ideological and cultural landscape of Iran, with far-reaching implications for its relationship with the West and its regional aspirations. The ideology that underpinned Ayatollah Khomeini's regime, particularly its opposition to Western influence and the ambition to export the Islamic Revolution, was radical political Islam. Khomeini's most prominent contribution to Islamic political thought was the concept of velayat faqi or the guardianship of the jurist. This principle advocated that a religious jurist should oversee all societal affairs, ensuring adherence to Sharia law and Islamic principles. This concept was the practical key to executing Khomeini's radical Islamic vision. It significantly deviated from traditional Shia thought, which typically refrained from direct clerical involvement in governance. Central to Khomeini's ideology 
was a strong opposition to Western influence, perceived as a corrupting and exploitative force against Islamic values and Iranian national interests. This perspective was informed by a sense of historical grievance against Western interference in Iran, particularly the role of the U.S. and U.K. in political affairs, including the 1953 coup against Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. Khomeini's vision extended beyond Iran. He aspired to inspire and support radical Islamic movements across the Muslim world, advocating for the overthrow of monarchies and secular leaders in favor of radical Islamist governance. Ultimately, Khomeini's vision was to bring death to the Western world, to bring death to America. This was part of the Ayatollah's broader strategy to ultimately unite the Muslim world under a shared radical Islamic ideology, opposing Western ideals like individual liberty and democracy. After the 1979 revolution, the initial populist rhetoric of the revolution gradually gave way to a radically theocratic governance. Khomeini and his inner circle systematically purged political allies who did not align with their radical Islamist vision, including liberals and moderate Muslims. Ayatollah Khomeini's regime was underpinned by a vision that was deeply rooted in radical Islamic principles, characterized by a strong opposition to Western influence and a commitment to exporting the Islamic revolution around the world. This ideological framework fundamentally reshaped Iran's political and social landscape and had lasting implications for its foreign policy and dismal relations with the West. Iran's post-revolutionary regime, under Ayatollah Khomeini, has actively sought to export its radical Islamic ideals beyond its borders, viewing this as a fundamental tenet of its foreign policy. This ambition is rooted in Khomeini's vision of a united Islamic front against perceived Western imperialism and secular Arab regimes. Key to this strategy is Iran's backing of proxy organizations in strategically important regions. For instance, in Lebanon, Iran has been a principal supporter of Hezbollah, a Shia Islamist political party and militant group. Formed in the 1980s, Hezbollah has grown with Iranian assistance into a significant political entity, falling in line with Iranian interests in the region. In the Palestinian territories, Iran has supported groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad, both of which seek Israel's destruction. These relationships allow Iran to exert influence in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, furthering its ideological and strategic objectives. This relationship led to significant events in the region. Iran's involvement in Syria is another example. By supporting the Assad regime, Iran aims to maintain a critical ally in the Arab world and secure its influence in the Levant. This involvement also serves to counter Saudi and Western influence in the region. In Yemen, Iran's support for the Houthi rebels reflects its strategy to extend influence in the Arabian Peninsula. This proxy conflict is part of a broader regional power struggle with Saudi Arabia, which sees the Houthis as a challenge to its interests. These activities demonstrate Iran's commitment to spreading its revolutionary ideology and establishing a sphere of influence in the Middle East. This strategy not only serves Iran's regional ambitions, but also positions it as a central player in many of the Middle East's most complex and enduring conflicts. The Iranian hostage crisis began on November 4, 1979, when radical Islamists seized the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, taking 52 American diplomats and citizens hostage. This event marked a severe escalation in U.S.-Iran tensions following Iran's 1979 Islamic Revolution and dramatically impacted international relations between the two nations. The crisis was triggered by deep-seated resentment towards America's long-standing support for the deposed Shah of Iran, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, particularly after the U.S. granted him asylum for medical treatment. This act was perceived by radical Islamic revolutionaries as a continuation of U.S. interference in Iranian affairs. They were paranoid that America was executing a broader plot to free Iranians from the grip of radical Islam by reinstating the Shah's regime. The U.S. Embassy seizure was a radical message against American principles and foreshadowed just how far radical Islamists were willing to go in order to globally export their radical Islamic revolution. The hostage crisis cast a long shadow over U.S.-Iran relations, escalating hostilities and significantly influencing American politics. 
notably contributing to President Jimmy Carter's defeat in the 1980 presidential election. Internationally, it highlighted the newly established Islamic Republic as one of the most radically anti-America regimes in the world, becoming a pivotal moment in the consolidation and exportation of the Iranian Revolution. After 444 grueling days, the crisis concluded on January 20th, 1981, with the hostages release coinciding minutely with Ronald Reagan's presidential inauguration, following negotiations facilitated by Algeria. This resolution includes the unfreezing of Iranian assets and a non-interference agreement from the U.S. regarding Iranian internal affairs. On the morning of October 23, 1983, Iranian-backed terrorist proxy Hezbollah killed 241 U.S. military personnel, including 220 Marines, 18 sailors, and three soldiers in a terrorist bombing of the Marine Corps barracks in Beirut, Lebanon. Minutes later, a second suicide bomber killed 58 French paratroopers. Six innocent Lebanese civilians also lost their lives. The abhorrent and shocking attack on the Beirut barracks remains to this day the single deadliest day for the U.S. Marine Corps since the Battle of Iwo Jima. The group Islamic Jihad Organization, believed to be connected to Hezbollah, claimed responsibility. Evidence suggested that these attacks were orchestrated at Iran's behest, part of the regime's broader strategy to exert influence in the region and push the West out of Lebanon. Declassified intelligence later revealed that Iran had in fact directed Hezbollah to, quote, take spectacular action against the United States Marines, this showcased Iran's hands-on role in a historic maiming of U.S. troops. The attacks not only led to the rapid withdrawal of the multinational force from Lebanon, but also demonstrated Iran's capacity to significantly impact U.S. military presence and morale in the Middle East. The repercussions of these bombings echoed across decades, influencing U.S. military strategies and perceptions of Iran as a sponsor of state terrorism. On the night of June 25, 1996, a devastating explosion at the Kobar Towers housing complex in Dharan, Saudi Arabia, claimed the lives of 19 U.S. Air Force personnel and injured hundreds. This attack again highlighted the persistent vulnerabilities of American troops as radical Islamic terrorists ran rogue around the world. A fuel truck packed with explosives was detonated near the housing complex which at the time hosted coalition forces involved in Operation Southern Watch. The explosion created a massive crater and caused significant destruction, affecting both military and civilian lives. Investigations by U.S. and Saudi authorities pointed to Iranian involvement with links to Saudi Hezbollah, a group believed to have received support and training in Lebanon's Bekaa Valley, a stronghold for Hezbollah activities supported by Iran. The complexity of the attack and the materials used suggested a well-organized plan with significant backing, possible only by state-sponsored terrorism orchestrated at the highest levels of the Iranian government. The bombing severely escalated U.S.-Iran tensions and had a profound impact on U.S. military operations in the Gulf. It led to changes in military housing policies and bolstered security measures for U.S. forces worldwide. Moreover, the Kobar Towers bombing remains a grim reminder of the threats faced by U.S. forces abroad and continues to influence U.S. foreign and security policies in the Middle East to this day. Throughout the 2000s, attacks orchestrated by Iranian proxies, such as Kataib Hezbollah and others, targeted American and British forces. These include the deadly 2007 Karbala raid in Iraq, where five American soldiers were abducted and killed, and numerous rocket attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq that caused multiple American casualties. These proxy groups have consistently utilized advanced military tactics, such as drone and missile technology, to strike at the heart of U.S. military operations, significantly heightening the human and strategic cost of America's presence in the region. In October 2011, U.S. authorities uncovered a plot backed by the Iranian Quds Force to assassinate Adel al-Jubair, the Saudi ambassador to the United States, using a bomb at a Washington, D.C. restaurant. The plan involved an Iranian-American, Mansour Arbabsiar, who was arrested and confessed to being recruited by Iranian military officials. 
The plot not only strained U.S.-Iran relations, but also exposed the global span of Iran's covert operations, shattering international law and diplomatic norms. The U.S. Department of Justice charged several Iranian military officials in connection, revealing extensive links between the plotters and Iran's elite military units. The assassination attempt and various proxy attacks illustrate Iran's strategic use of asymmetrical warfare to influence regional politics and deter Western intervention. These actions seek to project power and provoke instability while maintaining plausible deniability. On October 7th, Hamas, supported by Iran, launched a coordinated barbaric assault on Israel. The attack began just before dawn, involving over 4,000 rockets fired across Israeli cities, breaches by barbaric Hamas terrorists into residential areas, and attacks at public gatherings, including a bloody massacre at the Nova Music Festival. The assault resulted in over 1,400 deaths, extensive property damage, and deep national and international trauma. The Islamic Republic of Iran has a significant hand in orchestrating these attacks. Training, funding, and strategic planning were provided by the IRGC, with specific tactics for the attack developed in collaboration with Hezbollah and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Just days before the massacre, key meetings in Tehran confirmed the final go-ahead for the operations, aimed at undermining emerging Arab-Israeli relations. Then on April 13, 2024, Iran stepped from behind its proxies and launched a direct assault on Israel for the first time ever. This unprecedented strike involved 170 drones, over 30 cruise missiles, and more than 120 ballistic missiles targeting various locations across the country. The attack marked a significant escalation in Iranian military involvement in the region. As we conclude our exploration of Iran's strategy to export its radical Islamic revolution, a clear pattern emerges. From the 1979 hostage crisis to direct missile and drone strikes on Israel in 2024, Iran has consistently utilized state-sponsored terrorism and proxy warfare to assert its influence and challenge Western dominance. Understanding Iran's historical and current strategies is essential for crafting effective international responses. The global community faces significant challenges in addressing Iran's actions, which require coordinated diplomatic, economic, and military strategies. Now, let's have a look at how America has handled the threat of Iran in recent years, from Barack Obama to Donald Trump to Joe Biden. As nuclear tensions escalated with Iran, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or JCPOA, engineered under President Barack Obama's leadership, was a dangerous act of appeasement negotiated by the Obama administration on a fatal pretense. They presumed they were negotiating with a Western-friendly reformer keen on dismantling the oppressive Islamic Republic. In reality, they faced Hassan Rouhani, a terrorist deeply embedded in the regime's most radical elements. Far from the moderate peacemaker the liberal media and far-left politicians made him out to be, Rouhani was a veteran of Iran's anti-American axis of evil, involved in decades of the regime's global terror operations. The Obama administration and other radical Islam sympathizers in the media failed or refused to acknowledge a critical fact, that Rouhani's candidacy was rubber-stamped by the radical revolutionary regime's ayatollahs. Would the radical revolutionaries seeking to destroy America approve of a president who did not subscribe to their ultimate goal? Absolutely not, and that is precisely what the far-left media and Obama administration fatally failed or refused to acknowledge. If you don't believe this, here is more context. Rouhani's era in the council coincided with some of the most damning acts of aggression, including support for Hezbollah, a dangerous terrorist proxy of Iran. He is even reported to be the mastermind in planning operations like the attacks on the AMIA building in Buenos Aires. Rouhani was the furthest thing from a so-called Western-friendly moderate. Despite the reality, the narrative of a moderate Rouhani persisted, underpinned by a significant media and diplomatic echo chamber. The media bought into the revolutionary regime's strategy to convince America they could come to the table in good faith. 
This misperception was not just a failure of intelligence. It was a deliberate oversight, ignoring the true nature of the radical Islamic regime and the fact that every single person the administration would deal with would come with anti-American Ayatollah's seal of approval. The Obama administration failed to appreciate that they were never negotiating with a single person. They were always, always, always dealing with the Ayatollahs, the same Ayatollahs hell-bent on destroying America. The consequences of these flawed negotiations were immediate and far-reaching. Instead of disarming the most pro-terrorist regime in the world, the Obama administration emboldened it, enabling the regime's continued pursuit of its radical anti-America agenda under the guise of good-faith diplomacy. The JCPOA allowed Iran to maintain thousands of centrifuges and offered sanctions relief that would finance Iran's continued terrorism and destabilization of the region. Despite promises of strict monitoring, the deal's sunset clauses and lenient restrictions on advanced centrifuge research were major flaws, allowing Iran too much leeway to escalate its nuclear capabilities covertly. The implementation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action swiftly moved to unfreeze billions in Iranian assets, injecting a fresh flow of capital into Tehran's coffers. Almost immediately, Iran gained access to $4.2 billion in assets and increased its export earnings by over $7 billion, bolstering its economic position significantly. They get the equivalent of a trillion U.S. dollars. They get conventional weapons. They continue to spin centrifuges, which will guarantee nuclear weapons. As a result, Iran expanded its regional influence, visibly supporting Assad's regime in Syria and enhancing its military foothold. Tehran was positioned to funnel more funds to its axis of evil across the region. Hezbollah, the Houthis, Hamas, because of the Obama administration's failure, they were all well-funded and further trained. The Iran deal was one of the worst and most one-sided transactions the United States has ever entered into. Despite the Obama administration's misinformed hopes for a moderation in Iran's policies, the regime's actions post-Iran deal painted a wildly different picture. The anticipated diplomatic moderation gave way to an escalated continuation of Iran's regional and global antagonism. The Obama administration's appeasement policy had dangerously failed. The empowerment of Iran's regime through appeasement prompted a reassessment of policy approaches, setting the stage for the Trump administration's pivot to a policy of maximum pressure. As the Obama administration's term concluded, the Islamic Republic of Iran stood emboldened and America's image stood weakened on the global stage. Entering office in 2017, President Donald Trump and his administration pledged a stark departure from the Obama-era weakness, aiming to restore American strength and deterrence against the Islamic Republic of Iran through a maximum pressure campaign. The cornerstone of the Trump administration's strategy was the reinstatement of sanctions on Iran, targeting critical sectors such as oil, banking, and shipping. Announced in May 2018, these sanctions marked a significant shift from the Obama-era failures. The administration's sanctions were aimed at cutting off the financial resources Iran used to fund destabilizing terror in the region and its nuclear program. Within six months, the Trump administration had fully reimposed sanctions lifted under the JCPOA impacting over 700 entities, including major banks and oil exporters. I am announcing today that the United States will withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. In a few moments, I will sign a presidential memorandum to begin reinstating U.S. nuclear sanctions on the Iranian regime. We're here this afternoon to change the course of history. After decades of division and conflict, we mark the dawn of a new Middle East. President Trump's decision to withdraw from the JCPOA in May 2018 was a much needed rejection of a failed deal that granted too much to Iran with too few guarantees in the interest of America. The Obama era deal had failed to curb Iran's terrorist and nuclear activities and instead had financed them. This reassertion of sanctions was not without pushback from the globalist community. The Trump administration faced criticism from European allies and others who were signatories to the original Obama-era deal. The sanctions were described as the toughest ever imposed on Iran, 
intended to deter the evil of Tehran and get them back to the negotiating table on America's terms. Under the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign, Iran faced severe economic turmoil. Sanctions reimposed on oil, banking, and shipping sectors led to a staggering contraction of the economy, with Iran's GDP shrinking by nearly 5% in 2020. These economic sanctions tanked Iran's ability to fund and support proxy terrorist groups across the Middle East, like Hezbollah and Hamas. With its currency plummeting and inflation soaring, the terrorist regime found its capacity to sustain terrorist and support terrorist proxies significantly curtailed, leading to a significant reduction in Iranian-backed destabilization in the region. Strategic military deterrence was markedly enhanced through the Trump administration's targeted killing of IRGC guard Qasem Soleimani in January 2020. Soleimani's elimination disrupted Iran's operational capabilities abroad, significantly weakening the strategic command of its extraterritorial military and militant activities, and delivering a profound blow to its influence across the Middle East. The aftermath of Soleimani's death saw a recalibration of Iran's military posture, with the Islamic Republic grappling with both internal dissent and a diminished ability to project power externally. This shift underscored the effectiveness of the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign in significantly weakening and deterring what was, under the Obama administration, one of the world's greatest threats to America. President Trump's maximum pressure campaign was not just a series of economic sanctions, but a comprehensive deterrence strategy that significantly degraded Iran's ability to fund terrorism and export its radical Islamic revolution. This approach reshaped Iran's role in regional politics, setting the stage for a new dynamic of Western dominance in Middle Eastern affairs under the Trump administration. As the Trump administration concluded, it left behind a legacy of strengthened U.S. deterrence and a weakened Iranian regime, having reasserted American strength and influence across the Middle East. In contrast, the Biden administration entered office with a promise to shift gears, signaling a return to the Obama-era policies of appeasement. President Biden campaigned on easing tensions with Iran, vowing to re-engage and re-enter the JCPOA. The Biden administration, Mike, has also rescinded the Trump administration's restoration of UN sanctions on Iran. This marked a significant policy reversal, aiming to replace maximum pressure with more failed negotiations and appeasement. In the early days of his presidency, Biden's administration quickly set the stage for appeasing the radical Islamic terrorists in Tehran, stripping the sanctions and military pressures that had isolated Iran during the Trump administration. The administration even revoked Iran's terrorist proxy, the Houthis terrorist designation. The United States government will revoke terrorist designations of Yemen's Houthi movement, reversing a policy imposed in the final days of the Trump administration. This shift directly undermined the leverage America had gained throughout the Trump years and re-empowered Iran to fuel destabilization in the region through state-sponsored terrorism. The Biden team pressed forward, emphasizing the need for a new approach to address what they saw as unsustainable tensions. This policy shift was accompanied by rhetoric that promised a more cooperative and multilateral framework, aligning with European allies who had opposed Trump's unilateral moves. As President Joe Biden took office, a significant pivot in U.S. foreign policy unfolded with the return of key figures from the Obama administration. This included appointing veterans like Robert Malley and Ariane Tabatabai, signaling a deliberate return to diplomatic engagements reminiscent of the 2015 JCPOA era. This signaled a deliberate revival of past failed engagements with Iran. As a result of the Biden administration's weak posturing, Iranian aggression was reignited. A series of unrelenting attacks on American forces in the Middle East, including a deadly assault on a U.S. base near the Jordanian-Syrian border. These attacks have left American service members dead and others severely injured. President Biden keeps giving them money to buy weapons to try to kill us. Senator, Do you not understand that? Things. Under President Trump, stringent sanctions on Iran's oil exports slashed the regime's revenues to $11.5 billion. The Trump administration's hardline stance included seizing multiple Iranian tankers, notably the Grace One, 
and four tankers carrying 1.1 million barrels of gasoline to Venezuela. These actions curtailed Iran's ability to fund terrorism and destabilize the region. In stark contrast, the Biden administration's lifting of sanctions led to Iranian oil revenues soaring over $100 billion. That's an over 700% increase from what they were making under Trump-era sanctions. Iran is waging war on the administration, on America, on our servicemen and women, and Joe Biden is so utterly weak, he doesn't do a damn thing about it. Additionally, while Iran continued to seize commercial ships, the U.S. Departments of Homeland Security and Treasury have hindered the seizure of Iranian vessels, enabling Iran's oil exports to reach their highest levels since 2018. The Biden administration and its Obama-era veterans stand by a strategy that not only previously failed to curb Iran's nuclear ambitions, but also encouraged its proxy wars and regional dominance ambitions, yet they continue. They seem to have no qualms with increasing violence rather than peace. As the Biden administration embraced a strategy of appeasement toward Iran, America's most loyal ally in the Middle East was at risk. The administration's appeasement policy signaled to Tehran a decrease in direct consequences for aggressive actions, emboldening Iran's ambitions for regional destabilization. Israel found itself increasingly isolated. The U.S. stance, which aimed to re-enter the nuclear deal with Iran, relaxed sanctions, providing Tehran with financial relief. This bolstered Iran's capability to support its terrorist proxies, putting Israel at existential risk. Then America's worst nightmare came true. On October 7, 2023, Iran, through its terrorist proxies, Hamas and Hezbollah, launched an orchestrated land, air, and sea terrorist attack on Israel. This ring of fire strategy was not just a show of force, but a clear message that Iran perceived itself as having the upper hand amidst U.S. diplomatic overtures. Amid these escalating tensions, the Biden administration's continued pressure on Israel to restrain its defensive actions against Hamas and Hezbollah has further complicated the alliance. This pressure reflects a significant misalignment in dealing with a state that vows destruction against Israel and holds American interests at risk. As we draw to a close, we've journeyed through the truth about Iran's axis of evil. From Hamas's relentless terrorism, Hezbollah's grip on Lebanon, to the Houthis' destabilizing force in Yemen, We've seen how these proxies, emboldened and funded by the Islamic Republic of Iran, have wreaked havoc across the Middle East, posing significant threats not just to regional stability, but to America. We've examined the Obama administration's fatal flaw, marked by the failed Iran nuclear deal, which provided Iran with the resources to fuel its terrorism. In contrast, the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign curbed Iran's influence through stringent sanctions and strategic military actions, reasserting American strength, deterring Iranian aggression, and making room for a historic peace deal between select Arab nations and Israel. Now, all of the Trump administration's peace efforts have been undone by the Biden administration. Sanctions against the terrorist Iranian regime have been lifted. Terrorist designations for Iranian-backed proxies have been revoked. The radical revolutionary regime is raking in billions of dollars and fueling terror across the globe. Still, the Obama-era failure to recognize that so long as the Islamic Republic stands and the Ayatollahs hold ultimate power, America will always be dealing with anti-American terrorist supporters who want them dead. When they tell you they want you dead, when they show you they want you dead, one thing is for sure, the Islamic Republic of Iran wants you dead. Will America choose four more years of appeasing terrorists to the point of nuclear destruction? Or will it forge a path that secures America's liberty and defeats the terrorism reigning in the Middle East right now? You decide. Learn more and help stop Iran. Visit secureamericanow.org.